want you to take your Bibles tonight, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We went through the first half of this chapter last week. I'm trying not to take a lengthy period of time going through these chapters, uh, but just um, uh, giving you uh, 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 what we can is, you know, wanted to, not wanting to cheat or, or rob or cut ourselves short or anything, but not belabor it either. And there's going to be places all the, along the way that are just good places to stop. And we're going to pick up. So this tonight in First Corinthians chapter nine, Paul is dealing with the care of the clergy. The the, the problem. He's answering questions, but there was another issue there that had been called into question. Was it proper for the church to take care of the the, the pastors, the the bishops, the elders, the full time staff? However you want to uh, phrase it. I said clergy because. It's Corinthians, and I have to alliterate everything. It's an illness I have, okay? It's just a disease, all right? And so he gives in the first 14 a claim for charges that, you know what, it, he did not take wages from the church at Corinth. And again, he did not do so just, just as a brief reminder because remember this issue of the meat that was being offered to idols that came into question? When Paul was winning people to Christ in, in Corinth, he knew it was going to be an issue and so he knew he had bigger things to deal with. And so as, as not, to receive, not to be taking wages from people that were bringing the meat offered to the temple of the idols, he just he worked for his own daily bread. He was able to avoid that issue. But now that it had come into question, he's able to clearly answer them, tells them in the next chapter they can't sit at the table of the Lord, the table of devils, and that it is right And now that they, those that know better do better. And yes, now you should be taking care of your pastoral servants. And so in verses 15, 23 uh, through 23, he's going to tell us what compelled him. Why, again, why he was compelled not to do so. And that, that, and what he's doing is he's emphasizing the fact that, yes, it's right for the church to care for its servants uh, and, and, and to take care of them. But they don't serve so that the church will care for them. They serve because they, they are compelled uh, by the call of God for preaching the gospel of Christ. And then he tells at the end of the chapter here what the true reward is, is that crown of incorruptibility, a crown that is pure, with a pure motive. And so we're going to pick up in verses 15, 23, where he talks about what compelled him uh, as, he, as he served, whether taking wages or none. And it says, he said, but I've used none of... The, but I, I have used none of these things. That means, again, he's referring to the fact that he did not take the wages uh, that, that were justly due him, uh, but he didn't take those. He said, uh, neither have I written these things that it should be done so unto me, for it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Now, again, Paul had every right to claim for the care of the church, but he had never used the benefits that were rightfully due him. And he wasn't writing to the church, as he says here uh, in the beginning of this portion of Scripture, so that he could claim back pay. He wasn't filing for back pay or lost time or workman's comp. Uh, uh, up, to this, Paul, up to this point in Paul's ministry, remember this is, um, this is on Paul's second, uh, Paul's probably in the middle of his second, uh, or in, in between his second and third missionary journey. Uh, at this point in his life, he had, so far, he had worked willingly with his own hands as a tent maker, supporting himself. And to be fair to Paul, he was a younger man bearing the yoke in his youth. He would take 
uh, support as he aged. Uh, we know that he took support from the church of Philippi as he labored in Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens. They supported him while he was in prison and, and other times. So there would come a point that he did, but at this time he didn't. And, and, but it was right for them, and he wasn't writing, uh, but it was right for them again to take care of those that serve, and, uh, that serve the church now. And he said he'd rather die. He'd rather die than anybody say that he just served for the sake of drawing a paycheck. That's not why he served. Uh, let me tell you something. No full-time servant of the Lord. I don't care if it's Christian school teacher. Have you seen what Christian school teachers make? They, they, don't, they don't take that job for the money. Okay? Uh, they don't make a third of what a public school teacher makes. And, and, and honestly, they do just as much college and they actually love their kids and, are, and going with less to invest more. It's not just a job where they, they have half the year off. Most of them have to support them. Often they have to support themselves in the summer with another occupation because they don't make $50,000 a year to only work 180 days a year with, with full benefits. They don't have that. Missionaries don't uh, uh, leave their occupations and, and go to the mission field. Uh, because there's more money for them in it. In fact, we know there's much less. And no, no good pastor, assistant pastor, I don't care what, the, what, what place of full-time service, they, they don't do it for the dollars and cents. No, they've they, they got to have their needs met. Everybody's got to have their needs met. Necessity, needs, that's the biblical word. Uh, but that's, that's not what compels them. And one of the, one of the most... One of the most hurtful things that anybody can say to any servant of Christ that has a true heart to serve the Lord is they're in it for the money. It's one of the most, there's probably nothing that wounds their heart anymore. You know, there's a man in our community, and honestly, he, I consider him a friend. He counts me a friend. Um, he was raised in church and goes to church if and when he feels like it. And, and, uh, and quite frankly, he's, he's pretty well off but he is just consumed with the fact that he believes most preachers are overpaid and don't do anything to earn what they get. Uh, he, he really is. He's a, honestly, he's a good guy. He's a sincere guy. And, and if I'm alone with him for two hours, he's, gonna, he, he's going to pry in to that. He's, he's going to press on that. And he wants to tell, I mean, he can tell you about churches that he does not attend and the kind of offerings and thinks that, uh, this is a man that professes to be saved, that does, used to go to church regularly, I wouldn't say faithful, but regular, and now goes again if and when he feels like it. And, and he would just, uh, he's, he knows about what preachers make and if, he, if he thinks that their home is too nice and and, and things like that for all, all kinds of churches in this area. He's just in everybody's business. And there's, you know, there's, there's nothing, if somebody's, if, if somebody's in it to serve the Lord, there's just not, there's just not a greater room. And, and a lot of these people are living in parsonages that, that, are, that do not belong to them. And if they resign their church, quite frankly, they have no place to go. And, you know, they're going to wind up renting off J. Ken in public housing on Social Security. And I don't mean that as any kind of a slur against their church. or, or I'm just saying, these. Uh, Paul wasn't in it for the money. He said, I'd rather die than somebody say that I was just in it because of all the glory. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of glory. I'll tell you what, most of my glory these days is all negative feedback on Facebook from old bitter church members. Okay? I could, uh, you know, uh, we had to duck down an aisle this week in a grocery store and we still got caught you know you ever the, and it was one of those everybody's everybody was hoping they wouldn't see each other but then you did and you, and so you had to go up and be polite and, and look I'm always going to be polite and I mean and I still pray for these people but but it don't mean that it's not awkward for them and awkward for us either look Paul was more concerned about his responsibility to Christ than his rights as a servant in the church he, Paul's concern was this yea woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Let me tell you what Paul was bothered by. If people were being saved or not. You find any, any servant of Christ, that's a missionary, a pastor, whatever, the, whatever the, it might be. If, if, there is, if there is a heartache that they have, is if they're not seeing people saved like they used to. Sometimes you were, you know, we live in days where you sow a lot more seed 
and see a lot less come up out of the ground. And we, you can find tares among the wheat anywhere you go. I went out earlier this week and Jenny and I were getting ready to walk in the building and there's, you know, we did all this landscaping out there and I mean, Cameron and Dylan this summer, I mean, you talk about Mexican water boys. I'm sure that that's some kind of offense to somebody, but okay. Uh, but I mean, you just talk about watering the grounds every single day. I mean, these guys worked morning and evening just trying to keep all this stuff alive and, and did a fantastic job. And you know, all the stuff's out there dead. It's all going to come back in the spring. But there were these three green bushes growing out of the rocks. I mean, huge. I pulled up weeds like this green as can be in the, in the middle of January. You know, you can grow junk all day long these days. But you try and, you try and get, you try to nurture life and it's just, it's just a 50-50 shot, it seems like. And, and that was what Paul was moved by. He was, he was concerned about that dispensation of grace. He had been, the gospel had been committed to him. And he was, uh, he was concerned about what, whether he was going to, uh, uh, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. He realized that it wasn't about an earthly reward. He was going to stand before God and give an account to be conscious of preaching the gospel. In verse 19, he says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. Paul was, looking, Paul was always looking for something more. But he wasn't looking for more money. He was looking for more, he was looking for more people. And Paul, he enjoyed the privilege of, of, of citizenship, free citizenship, and an empire of slavery. But he used his liberty to make himself the servant of to others. He wasn't one man's servant. He was every man's servant. Paul's gain was not obtained in currency, but in converse. It didn't matter to him, too, if they were Jews or Gentiles. To the Jew, he became a Jew. He's well equipped. He's a Jew. I mean, uh, and he was more Jewish than the average Jew. I mean, Philippians 3.5, he, he gives his, his pedigree, we might say, circumcised the eighth day. You know, keeping that, the circumcision, the covenant of the, the Abrahamic covenant, token of the covenant of the law, or, or, or of the, the seed of promise be, before the law. And then of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, uh, an Hebrew of the Hebrews is touching the law of Pharisee. We know a member of the Sanhedrin raised at the feet of Gamaliel. I, I mean, j Paul was, grew up an Orthodox Jew. If anybody could reach a Jew, Paul would take the law of Moses and the prophets of Israel and point the Jews to a Jewish Messiah and show them that Jesus had fulfilled the law. And he said, no, I'm not without the law. In fact, I want you to notice something that he says in verse 21, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. You know, there's this crowd today that wants to say, well, since under the New Testament, there is no more law. That's a bunch of hogwash. In the Old Testament, the law governed and ruled over mankind. And when the law was done with the man, it brought forth death. In the New Testament, grace, according to Romans 6 and 7, grace is the governing authority and grace frees a man from the bondage and the chains of the law and from the debt of sin of the law to walk in liberty and newness of life with him. And it's, it's not that we may sin that grace may abound, but that we that are dead to sin continue no longer therein. And there is still the law, uh, uh, there is still, a, Paul was still a servant to the law of God. I mean, you ought to look out how many times in the Bible, the New Testament, it talks about uh, serving the law of Christ or the law of God. And uh, he t in fact, he, he mentioned that in, uh, I think, Romans chapter 7, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. There is a law of Christ. It's just not the law of sin. And, and uh, that's Romans 7, 25. And Paul, uh, he, so he, he showed them through the law that Christ satisfied the law and paid their debt of sin on the cross. And, and again, he was no longer serving the law of Moses, but the law of Christ. And, and uh, where the law condemned, grace freed. And, and the Gentiles, he said to them that were without the law, that the law of Moses meant nothing to the Gentiles. They didn't care less about Jewish law. They didn't care. They were Gentiles. The rest of the world, he said, if they're outside the law, he said, well, then I'm Saul of Tarsus, of Cilicia. He said that uh, they, they, the law had no bearing on their lives whatsoever. You know, Paul, I, I just thinking back to Acts chapter 17 this afternoon. He's wandering the streets of Athens and he's looking at all these, all these Grecian gods all over the place. And he comes to Mars Hill and there's the unknown God. And Paul says to them that were without the law, I can work with that. And he stands up at Mars Hill and he preaches that great message to the unknown God. 
And he says, the, you, I can tell you who the unknown God is. And he preached Jesus to them. Didn't matter if they were Jews or Gentiles. Uh, what, he, he was made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. You ever hear that old saying, all's fair in love and war? Well, if it's all fair than, in love and war, then all is fair when it comes to demonstrating the love of God in the war for souls of mankind. You know, Paul, he, whatever he had to do to see someone saved, that, that, that's what he was willing to do. Uh, just let me say something. And uh, that, that's why we do things like we'll have a wild game feast. Or sometimes it's a, a lady's luncheon with a mother-daughter or a lady's thing. Or, or sometimes, uh, you know, you have a bus promotion and somebody's got to swallow a goldfish or give away a bicycle or, or, or whatever. Or vacation Bible school. Or maybe it's people that will, won't come to church um, just to come to a church service, but they'll come for a, a resurrection Sunday if there's a cantata. Or they'll come to a Christmas play because uh, they got some, some family member or your children that they're close to and they'll come see them in a Christian play. They wouldn't come for any other reason, but you have a, a means, a tool to be able to bring somebody to church. They, they might not come for their church themselves, but if they have a fill a pew Sunday and hey, if I can fill my pew, uh, I'll get a brand new Bible. Would you come help me get a new Bible? And, and they wouldn't come for themselves, but, and some people criticize that. Well, Paul did whatever he had to do by all means, to save some. And, and you know, I, I heard a guy say years ago, and I, I like what he said, I, I'd, give a, I'd give away a bicycle if it'd keep a kid out of hell. You know? But Jesus, a lot of people came to him for the means, what, he, what they could get from him. They came, he didn't have to, look, he, he didn't have to heal them. He didn't have to feed them. He didn't have to give them the bread and the fish. He didn't have to, he could leave, he could, uh, you, you're not serious about getting saved and send them home with the same disease they came with? And you, you know, they, they, criticized, they criticized Paul for his methods and they criticized Jesus for his methods. The son of man came eating and drinking. They said, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Oh, he, Jesus was just a drunk and he was just, he was just looking to get a free meal. There, you know, more, more preacher hate. But his wisdom was proven by the number of publicans and harlots that became the children of God by faith. But just remember, if somebody's criticizing you and kicking you from behind, that just means you're going forward. Amen? That's just what we were taught. So don't worry about people. You know, sometimes they criticize. Well, you just pass out those tracts. Do you know how many people are saved by tracts? You ought to read the Bible tract uh, uh, Incorporated those bulletins that they put out in the fellowship track league. There are stories every month, written, handwritten, where people write in, send a track, and, and tell exactly what track they received and where they got it and how they got saved. I, I mean, tracks still work. I don't care if you roll them up in the toilet paper in the bathroom stall at a truck stop or leave them on the table with, with the waitress at a restaurant or at the hospital. I went into the hospital one day years ago. I remember uh, uh, Brother Jack, Kim was having surgery, and uh, the, and years ago, and 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 I had gone in and been with the family and prayed. I was getting ready to leave, and I went out to the waiting area, and I was going to put tracks out. And he'd already been out there and beat me to it. Every table, every chair, he had chick tracks all over the place out there. Whatever means it takes. I've I've gotten hate mail. I've gotten hate mail from the hospital because somebody read this was your life while their father was having a heart attack in the back. But it obviously got to them and rattled their cage. I've had people call me from the Piggly Wiggly in, in, in Walmart and Linton and Dollar Generals and Jasonville complaining about people putting tracks and cases of beer. I think that's great. I don't know who you are, but please keep it up. Because all I do is I don't, I don't have any idea who's doing it. And I don't say I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. Somebody ought to read a track before they pop a top. Whatever means, just just... Whatever you have. And then in these final verses, he, he, he talks about he is, Paul, Paul is, it's not that Paul's not concerned with reward. In fact, he uses that word. If you paid attention through verses 15 through 23, he talked about reward often. And here he'll tell us the real reward that he's looking for. Know ye not 
that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a, a castaway. Now, look, there are there are two great lines of truth that run parallel throughout the Bible, especially throughout the New Testament. Salvation is by grace through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's a, that's an, uh, that, that, that is a, a fact that is without, without deviation. Salvation is by grace alone. And the other one that runs parallel is that God rewards Christian service. And Paul tells us what compelled men to Christ. He would not be without his uh, reward. And Paul did labor for a reward. He labored for a crown, an incorruptible crown. And it's easy to see, if, reading these verses, that Paul was well, well versed in the athletic events and the games of his day. He was, I believe Paul was a man's man, a red-blooded man, and uh, he had admiration for the things that men accomplished in the athletic uh, arena. Uh, the, you know, the Bible is clear that, uh, uh, that God does not take pleasure in those things, but it, it also, uh, he, we also find no prohibition if they are in their proper place. You know, Psalm 147.10 says that God, he delighteth not in the strength of the horse. He taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. I, I love to see horses run and, you know, run a race. Now, I'm not talking about butt and track, okay? That seems to be all that's associated today. Uh, but, I, I mean, it's something to see horses just, to, to just run. And it's, it's, it's interesting to see anybody, any, any kind of a race. And, and uh, God has no pleasure in the legs of a man. He doesn't matter if it's horse race or, or, or a man race. God, it doesn't matter to God. Uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, that Paul didn't have an admiration for for these things. And uh, based on this passage he, and other places in the New Testament, he actually had quite a bit of knowledge about the athletic events of his day. If you were to go, uh, you remember he's writing to the church at Corinth. Outside the city of Corinth is the Isthmian Plain. The Isthmian uh, Plain is where uh, the Greeks held games three times a year, and in Paul's day, they they were absolutely the the most prestigious uh, games anywhere in the Roman Empire. They superseded the Olympic Games. The Olympic Games were nothing compared to the Isthmian Games. And Corinth was very proud of these games. And, and so Paul knew that they would be familiar he, with the illustration he's giving uh, with a couple of the more popular uh, games illustrating reward for service. And he uses the race. The Greek word for race is stadium. We get our e English word stadium from that. And it speaks of a racetrack. And the, the stadium or a racetrack at Corinth was uh, the, where they run their races. It was only about 200 yards long, 600 feet. It was one-eighth of a Roman mile. And uh, he reminds us that only one person wins the race. Look, you've heard me say this often through the years. God doesn't pass out snow cones and participation certificates. And not everybody's going to get a trophy, and everybody's going to get a prize. Everybody has to, a race to run. If you run your race, you will receive your prize. You will not refuse your, if you don't run your race because your back hurt, your fibromyalgia kicked up, you had a sore knee, somebody tripped you, there's no crowns for quitters. And, there, and there's no crowns for people that start. There, there's no place for people that won't start. He said, run that you may obtain. And it's one of those races. It's not a race where we're running, competing against each, uh, each other. We, we each have a race to run. If we run our race, we obtain our crown. Run that you may obtain. We run against ourselves. Years ago, when, uh, you know, be, before I came here, I had a, a martial arts school. And I always, the students that I trained, I always taught them, and this is true of any athletic event, you never compete about against anybody else except yourself. I don't care what the sport is. I don't care if it's a race. I don't care if it's basketball, football, whatever it might be, martial arts. It, you, you always compete against yourself. Because if you compete against somebody else, one of two things happens. Either they're better than you, and you're going to surpass them, and once you've reached your goal, you quit because you satisfied your goal. Or they're better than you're ever going to be, and you're going to be frustrated because you can't attain to what they've done, and then you're going to quit. And that's true of any event. And, and that's kind of what's in mind here is that when we run, it's not about am I trying to 
uh, uh, beat somebody else to the finish line. I have a race that Christ has given me. If I run my race, I will win my prize. I'm competing against myself. And, and he gives us a secret in verse 25. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. That word mastery is where we get our English word agonize from. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it sounds like, uh, the Greek word sounds just like the word agonize. And Christian service is a race for a reward, but it's an agonizing race. That means we're going to strive. It means it's going to take effort. You're going to have to put in your time. You're going to have to train. Uh, you're, you're, going to, uh, you're going to run into opposition. It's not going to be easy. And if you're going to master your race, you're going to have to be temperate. And this is not the same word for temperance found other places in the New Testament. Uh, it, it refers to self-discipline or self-control. Uh, there, there was a time when... Uh, uh, before I had a school and I was just a student in the martial arts that I competed in tournaments and, and I was competing for a spot uh, and this is this has been over good night nice, well it's been well over 25 years old uh, 25 years ago but there was a time when I wanted to compete for a spot uh, on the Olympic team when it was an uh, Olympic demonstration sport and uh, the year that 96 the, the year that I was com trying to compete for a spot on the team uh, they wound up they had it in 92 and then they didn't have it in 96 and they brought it back in 2000 I don't even think they have it anymore but I, I was competing for a place but uh, on the team and there were special classes that I attended they were even called Olympic classes my instructor he and his brother were the olympic coaches and and they uh uh uh, they had special Olympic classes, but it wasn't just what I did in class. It was what I did outside of class. And at that time, I had to put in five hours a day working a job. I was even in college still, but I had to put in five hours a day. Now, I never wound up again. They never wound up having uh, the Olympics that year. I don't know if I would have made that five-man roster or not. I, I competed against a lot of people uh, that had on the previous and was a contender for that. But there, but it took a lot of self-discipline, self-control. I had to watch uh, what I ate uh, uh, and, and uh, training and all these different things. It, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of effort. And Paul, uh, Paul says in another place, he told Timothy, and this is what I want you to get here, and if a man also strive for mastery, it's just like he says here in 1 Corinthians, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. This is what the point Paul was trying to make was striving for the mastery. What took the self-discipline and the self-control is that, remember what he said about the law of Christ and God that he had to keep? He was under a law. He was running his race. He was laboring for a reward, but he had to do so lawfully. Can I say it this way? You won't be crowned unless you play by the rules. And God sets the rules. Let me put it like this. You're, you're not, God's not going to reward you for teaching Sunday school if you get drunk in a bar on Saturday night. God doesn't allow us to keep sin in our life and then reward us for service. No, we're going to have to play by the rules. We're going to have to strive for the master. We're going to have to strive temperate in all things and lawfully and bring uh, our body under subjection like Paul says. It, it, uh, again, you're not going to uh, sit there and keep pet sins, secret faults and presumptuous sins and, and presumptuous sins. We're presuming against the grace of God. Well, God knows uh, that I'm going to struggle with something and so I might as well just have keep this, this thing. And, but as long as I do something for the Lord, as long as I go soul winning, I can look at pornography or I can do whatever. Or plug in whatever it is that the Holy Spirit puts in your head, whatever your besetting sin is. And look, that's why he says, let us lay aside every weight. There's the race again. One of the things that we know runners do, what do they do? They, 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 they put on, uh, they, they, they don't go out there dressed in a parka, do they? They're, they're not running in combat boots. I mean, they'll shave, their, they'll shave every hair on their body. They, they, they take off, they'll run with weights to build resistance, to train, but when it comes time for the race, they'll take it off. And lay aside every weight and the sin, which so doth be easily beset us. That Paul said in Hebrews that there are things in our life that they're not sinful. There's nothing wrong with them. But you don't. But you're not going to be as good in the race as you ought to be. And so we ought to be willing to lay that thing aside. 
because it's, it's going to be a hindrance. It's going to slow us down. It's not good for us in the race. And Paul was fixing it. And if there's anything you know about a race, especially if you're only running 200 yards, is you're just going to put your eye on that finish line and, and, and keep your, that, and that's what he said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy was set before him. He said, we, we look, we fixate on our, on our goal. He said that he would, in Philippians, that he could win, he wanted to win Christ and to be apprehended of him. And, and contrary to a lot of people, what they believe, harboring sin in our lives disqualifies our service. God will not reward us for, for service if, if we keep sin. You know, you can read almost daily about some athlete in, in any number of sports that's being disqualified for cheating in, in, one, in one way or another. Uh, I remember a few years ago that, uh, how, how many remember uh, Lance Armstrong, the cyclist? And when he first won the Tour de France in 1999, he had had cancer. And he in, immediately became like just the poster child for inspiration and, and resilience, you know, that he'd overcome cancer and won the Tour de France. And not only did he win it in 1999, he won it seven years in a row. Seven years in a row won the Tour de France. And then 2012, 13, somewhere in there, they found out that he had been using performance enhancing drugs and he was stripped of all his titles what a disappointment what a disappointment Paul you know Paul fixated on running his race well he wanted to win that crown I wonder if Christians put the same effort into our service and the race that Christ has given us that the world's athletes do, amateur or professional, well, I think, we'd, I think we would see a lot more done for Jesus Christ. Let me ask you something. Do you strive to do your best and be your best in your place of service? Number one, do you have a place of service? And do you do your best? Do you want to be the best Sunday school teacher you can be? It's just singing in the choir, just singing in the choir, or do you want to be the very best that you can be. You know, just, just for sake of time and for illustration, same thing, I could say the bus ministry, nursing home, no matter what it is, you can pick anything you want, but you know, th there, are, there are Sunday school teachers that on Sunday morning, 30 minutes before they go out the door, they look at the lesson, depend upon what knowledge they have of the Bible story and go in and teach their class. And then there's that, then there's that teacher that uh, on, on Monday, they read their Sunday school lesson for the next Sunday, at least once a day, every day, for six days so that they get it in their head and they get it in their heart and they pray for their class every single day and then they think about that lesson as they go to work and throughout the day and how is that lesson who are my kids and what their home life is like and are they a church kid or they a bus kid do they come from a good home they have and how how can this lesson be a help to every child y'all getting the picture here that's what Paul was focused on how can I, am I doing my best? We sing that song, I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? You understand the world runs to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. You know, the one thing that, uh, the, another thing that's just kind of hidden here in this text is that citizenship was never the crown. It wasn't if they ran the race, they would be free citizens like Paul. In fact, you were not allowed to run in a race or compete in any of these games unless you were already a Greek citizen. Only Greek citizens could participate in the Isthmian game of Corinth. They had to prove parentage before they were allowed to enter any contest. And again, we're talking about two parallel lines. Salvation is already settled. It's a service is for a child of God. We're not saved by service, but we are saved to serve. And when you watched the race at Corinth, you knew that every contestant was a Greek citizen. And so again, only a child of God can run to receive reward for Christian service. God doesn't crown the devil's children. And the young male that would receive his prize received a corruptible crown. I mean, he, he literally, they didn't get gold, silver, and bronze medals like we have today. They, they literally got a, a laurel wreath uh, that would be made from something like a wild olive branch or parsley or wild celery or, or even pine. I mean, those are not things that people cherish and treasure. Uh, within, a few, within a day or two, they would fade. It was all seemingly for nothing. They ran for honor and for glory. And a Christian, if they're incorruptible, if they're pure in their heart and in their motive, they run for the honor and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ.
That's the crown. And by, that's a crown that doesn't fade away. Now, I'm not going to take the time tonight. There are five crowns in the Bible. This is one of them that where God crowns, his, God clearly tells us throughout Scripture that he crowns his servants with reward. The crown of incorruptibility here for those who are not corrupted by the people of this world, the things of this world, the ways of this world, but that we're fixated on our service to Christ. Uh, there's a crown of rejoicing or a soul winner's crown that Paul talks about and a crown of righteousness for those that love the Lord's appearing, the crown of life for those that are faithful unto death and the, the crown of glory that fadeth not away for shepherds that feed and lead God's flock. But there, God does reward those who serve with their, uh, for, for his honor and glory. Probably most people in here probably have probably if, at least heard of, if not seen, the old movie Chariots of Fire based on that true story of Eric Liddell uh, in the 1924 Olympics where uh, he, his event was the 100 meter race and he was, uh, he was the favorite to win that for Scotland. And they were, but he had to, the qualifying heats were all on Sunday, all on the Lord's Day. And Eric Liddell refused, think about that, this has been almost 100 years ago, but he refused to, to qualify. He would not run the qualifying heat on the Lord's Day. What about it? Refused, boy, and can you imagine how popular he was at home? You know how many, do you know how many of the church people were pushing him to compromise and to run on the Lord's Day for the sake of Scotland? But he refused to do it. And then later in the week, through a chain of events, he wound up having an opportunity to run the 400-meter race, not his race, and took the gold. But the real reward he took was when he finished college and went to China as a missionary. Let me tell you something. When Eric Livedell stands before the Lord, you know what? That gold medal from 1924, it ain't going to be there. That's wood, hay, stubble, man. But what he did in China for the rest of his life as a missionary, that, that is the gold, the silver, the precious stone. By the way, we ought to emphasize that more than we do the other. Again, this, there's nothing wrong with this in its place. But he said, this, that I therefore, in light of these things, I therefore so run. He runs a certain way, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believe it, and am persuaded that he is able to keep me against that day. Paul concluded, he said, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Uh, that, that words, those words I keep under my body, it means to strike beneath the eye or to give a black eye. Paul controlled his flesh because uh, he brought himself under subjection, like he said in Romans 7. He didn't do the things that the flesh wanted to do. His flesh wanted to do one thing, but he knew that the Lord wanted him to do something else, and he had to make himself do the things that God wanted him to do and deny himself. And, and so he brought his body under subjection. Why? He didn't want to give Jesus a black eye. He didn't want to be a castaway. He didn't want to be that guy that he had preached to others, and they ran their race and received their reward, and then Paul gets to the end of his life, and he's a castaway. And it's not talking about a loss of salvation. Again, it's a loss of reward. And Jesus, uh, in 2 John chapter 1, verse 8, 2 John tells us, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. You can't lose your salvation, but you can lose your I know at least three pastors who have committed suicide when their sins found them out. I believe, I, I believe they're saved. I believe I'll see them in heaven one day, but I believe they forfeited their reward by the things that led them in their life, their secret sins that when the, be sure your sin will find you out, and then it did, and then it was, they, couldn't, they couldn't live with the consequences, and they ended their own lives. Nobody wants to be that castaway. I think ben Johnson from Canada set a world record, a brand new world record. I remember it in the 100-meter race in the 1988 Olympics in Seoul, Korea, and then three days later, he was disqualified, a castaway, for testing positive for steroids. His medal was taken and given to American Carl Lewis, and in 1993, he failed another drug test and was permanently banned for life. Paul was terrified at the thought that others that he had taught to run and taught to fight, that, that he would be a castaway for violating the rules and that others that he had led to Christ received the reward and he lost his. That's a... We could all use a little bit of that fear of the Lord. It would remind us of, of, of what's important, not just for, for the time that we have here, but the time that 
we have for eternity. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the uh, Bible study tonight. Lord, we pray that it's been a s simple truth that's been, Lord, a needed reminder. Lord, we all need this reminder. Lord, for the purpose, Lord, uh, for which we labor. Lord, that we labor not for our own gain, that we labor not for personal uh, glory, for personal honor, but Lord, for, the, for your honor, for your glory. And Lord, that your, uh, Lord, that your fields would have laborers. Lord, that we might bring forth that 30, that 60, that 100 fold. We pray now that you would meet with us in a house of prayer and bless now the invitation this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. The piano's playing. The altar's open. The Lord's spoken to you somewhere along the way. Maybe it's prayer meeting night. House of prayer. You have a prayer request you need to personally bring before the Lord tonight. Why don't you do that now? And Maybe somewhere along the way the Lord's just reminded us about the importance of our Christian service, about the reward that will outlast all other rewards. <laughs>